It's really easy to imitate the bad parts of Steve of being an The only problem with Microsoft is they just have no taste. Steve Jobs, one of the most inspiring tech entrepreneurs who built Apple into a billion dollar tech giant. Bill Gates, another tech billionaire and entrepreneur who built Microsoft from the ground up into a giant software company. They were the two main faces of the digital age in the late 90s. Being founders of successful tech companies, having a rivalry between companies was normal. However, this was no ordinary brand rivalry. This was personal for Steve Jobs as well as for Bill Gates. In this video, we'll dive deep into how this great tech rivalry between Steve Jobs and Bill Gates started. That shook the whole tech industry. Steve Jobs was born in 1955 and raised by adoptive parents in Cupertino, California. Brought up in a humble family, Steve dropped out of college in six months and took up a job at Atari Corporation as a video game designer in early 1974. Whereas talking about Bill Gates, he has quite a lavish and clean-cut upbringing. Born in 1955, he was raised by his father, who was a prominent lawyer, and his mother, who was a community volunteer. Gates had a keen interest in programming and joined Harvard University in the autumn of 1973. However, he also eventually dropped out. While they both dropped out of college, they both went down a different road. Steve was having a tough time surviving. He would often sleep on the floor of his friend's room and would often get food from the local temple. Inspired by the hippies and after saving up some money, Steve decided to go on a pilgrimage to India in 1974 to experience Buddhism and seek enlightenment. To think that this guy is gonna be the CEO of the biggest tech giant in history seems far-fetched, isn't it? Ordinary people would have guessed that this guy is either going to be homeless or a hippie for life. Things were not going quite well for Jobs to say the least. Bill Gates, on the other hand, wasn't interested much in finding spirituality or himself. He was just a nerd geeking over logic, coding, and computers. Both of them were doing their own thing until the universe brought these characters under the same roof. Life can be much broader once you discover one simple fact, and that is everything around you that you call life was made up by people that were no smarter than you. And you can change it, you can influence it, you can, you can build your own things that other people can use. And the minute that you understand that you can poke life and actually something will, you know, if you push in, something will pop out the other side, that you can, you can change it, you can mold it, um, that's maybe the most important thing. After Steve Jobs came back from India, he found a keen interest in what his high school buddy, Steve Wozniak, was doing with computer technology. In 1976, Jobs and Wozniak founded Apple and started working out of Jobs' garage. Their first computer, the Apple I, was a circuit board enthusiasts loved. The Apple II revolutionized the computer industry with the introduction of the first ever color graphics. Using an Apple II is very easy. The only hard part is getting your kid away from it. Sales jumped from 7.8 million in 1978 to 117 million in 1980 establishing Apple as a major player. In the meantime, Bill was also starting up his own venture called Microsoft with his childhood friend, Paul Allen. Unlike Steve, Bill was interested more in building computer software and programming rather than hardware. Their philosophy was to make products that are cross-compatible and can run on multiple systems. This was and is still the key for Microsoft products and their high rate of adoption in the computer software market. However, Steve Jobs wholeheartedly was against this strategy of Microsoft. Well, you can already see that his vision was to build an ecosystem for Apple, and at present, it is the perfect example of building a tech ecosystem in the world. Now, you might be wondering, how the f*** did these two geniuses actually met each other for the first time? Well, it was actually Steve who reached out to Bill to create software for their mega popular Apple II PC, and Gates would routinely fly down to Cupertino to see what Apple was working on. In the early 80s, Jobs flew up to Washington to sell Gates on the possibility of making Microsoft software for the Apple Macintosh computer. Uh, I was enthused. Microsoft doesn't work with new, new hardware very often, but uh, we put a, a team of people on it from the beginning, and we're planning that over half of our retail sales next year will come from, from Macintosh software. With its revolutionary graphical user interface, Gates wasn't particularly impressed with what he saw as a limited platform, or Jobs' attitude. Late in an interview with Fortune, Gates said, it was kind of a weird seduction visit where Steve was saying, we don't really need you and we're doing this great thing and it's under the cover. He's in his Steve Jobs sales mode, but kind of the sales mode that also says, 
I don't need you, but I might let you be involved. While he still appeared alongside Jobs in a dating game riff, screened for Apple employees ahead of the Macintosh's launch. Welcome to the Macintosh software dating game. In that video, Gates complimented the Mac as a product. Microsoft and Apple worked hand in hand for the first few years of the Macintosh. At one point, Gates funnily mentioned that he had more people working on the Mac than Jobs did. Things were already smooth between the two in their businesses until Bill Gates and Microsoft launched their iconic product that we all use daily, the Windows. Hello, I'm Bill Gates, Chairman of Microsoft. In this video, you're going to see the future, Windows. When Gates launched the first version of Windows in 1985, their relationship hit rock bottom and they became arch rivals. Jobs accused Gates and Microsoft of ripping off the Macintosh's graphical user interface. Well, the thing was, Apple was looking to launch their massive new product called Lisa, which was named after his child with a former high school girlfriend. A mass market PC that had an evolved system and a graphical user interface. So when Jobs wanted to create programs for Lisa and asked Bill if he could do it, in response, he obviously said yes, but he wanted a prototype of Lisa to make it work. And so Jobs sent him one. Why wouldn't he, right? But when Bill turned the PC on for the first time, he was left stunned. The graphical interface left him completely in awe. Things like files, folders, mouse pointers, copy, paste, etc. It was a revolutionary innovation. But guess what? Bill Gates knew. He knew that this would revolutionize the way people use computers. A few months later, after creating a lot of hype, when Apple launched Lisa to the public on January 19, 1983, at 9.995, they had high hopes. However, it completely fell flat. In fact, to date, it was Apple's worst commercial failure since the 1980 Apple III. In total, it only ever shipped 10,000 units. So while Steve Jobs and Apple panicked, Bill Gates thought that now was an excellent moment to launch his Microsoft product, their own Windows operating system with its own GUI. As soon as the news reached Steve Jobs, he insisted that Gates talk to him. And as soon as Steve Jobs got in touch with Bill Gates, he simply jumped in on him, shouting at him, you're ripping us off and claiming that he trusted him. And then Bill Gates calmly said, well, Steve, I believe there is more than one way of looking at it. I think it's more like that we both had this rich neighbor named Xerox, and I broke into his house to steal the TV set and found out that you had already stolen it. To give you more content on the Xerox thing, back in 1979, Steve Jobs and Apple were invited to Xerox Park, where he got to see what they were working on, the world's first GUI. Steve Jobs witnessed this, got inspiration from him, and applied it to his Apple products. Basically, they stole the idea from Xerox, exactly what he accused Gates of doing. Anyway, while everything was going on, things were not looking good for Steve Jobs at Apple. Steve Jobs had recently hired John Scully, former Pepsi CEO, to take over Apple's business operations. He was a force to be reckoned with. It is said that he single-handedly increased the market share of Pepsi in the Coca-Cola-dominated market and turned it into a leading cola brand hall. However, this might have been a disastrous judgment by Steve Jobs. He and Scully frequently clashed, particularly over the Macintosh and Lisa products. When both of these failed to live up to sales expectations, Jobs was moved away from the Macintosh product and was furious about the change, taking his case straight to Apple's board of directors. Shortly after the attempted corporate power play, Jobs resigned from Apple in 1985. And thus, while Apple and Steve Jobs' career was in flames, Bill Gates was sitting pretty well. Life was good for him at that point. His picture was on the cover of every imaginable tech or business magazine. Gates was winning, and Jobs' career was clearly on the ropes. By 1987, at the age of 31, Gates had become the world's youngest billionaire. His firm was shattering financial records, and in 1995, Bill Gates became the world's richest man. Jobs, on the other hand, had experienced another failure. His new firm, Next Computing, was a complete catastrophe. However, he began to experience a stroke of luck when he purchased the graphics group under this venture, and they were working on computer-generated imagery. They ended up working with Disney to develop the now iconic film, Toy Story. This firm eventually became what we today know as Pixar Studios, 
Meanwhile, his darling company, Apple, was on the brink of bankruptcy. Can you imagine that? While this was going on, Apple acquired Next Computing for $429 million and brought Jobs back to the company he originally founded. Obviously, to most of us, that's pretty good money. But for Steve, he was quite far behind Bill Gates. After a huge stock sale devalued the company's stock, Apple's board sacked its then CEO, Gil Emilio. To take his position, the board made a controversial decision to hire Steve Jobs as the CEO. And what a terrific hire that turned out to be. On the other hand, Windows worked so brilliantly that it had practically become a monopoly in the market. And they were facing the very real risk of being split up. This caused Bill Gates to make an unexpected decision. In 1997, just as Apple was poised to declare bankruptcy, he invested $150 million in the company. They were effectively saved from bankruptcy. In an unusual turn of events, Steve Jobs was forced to hold a press conference, you know, to thank Billy Gates for the funds. And that didn't go down well with the Apple lovers who were still out there for whatever reason. They booed Bill Gates' face as it appeared on the screen, and they were not enthused about Apple's future with Bill Gates. However, this led to 1998 when Steve Jobs released his first product since his comeback, the iMac. So. Thank you. And it was an immediate success. In terms of pure numbers, Microsoft remained dominant. But Apple was beginning to carve out a little place for itself as a manufacturer of creative, design-driven, high-quality products. In 2001, Apple introduced the iPod, another great triumph, but this time it began to shift the competitiveness of Microsoft and Apple. The iPod, together with the iTunes Store, transformed music listening for millions. So Microsoft began to sense this and develop their competitor product. Do you recall? I bet you don't because nobody gave a crap about the Zune Media Player, which was released in 2006. Again in 2007, Apple would revolutionize the world with the iPhone. It has become the new standard for smartphones. This new Apple arena posed a dilemma for Microsoft, and they also launched the Windows Mobile and later the Windows Phone OS, and they fell flat in the smartphone market. This all built up to 2007, when Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were spotted openly sitting together in a live conference. People were quite skeptical about how both of them would react considering their very complicated past and their rivalry. However, things went pretty damn well as both of them had a very genuine appreciation for each other. While both of them played a major role in the evolution of tech around the globe and Silicon Valley around this time, Jobs was diagnosed with a rare form of pancreatic cancer. His doctors advised him to seek surgery as soon as possible. Instead, he delayed the procedure for nine months and attempted to treat himself with alternative medicine. This decision deteriorated his health as the time passed. Unfortunately, Steve died from pancreatic cancer complications on October 5th, 2011, just eight years after his initial diagnosis. He was only 56 years old when he died, but his cancer had taken such a toll on his body that he looked gaunt, frail, and much older than his actual age. However, before his death, Apple had reached the feat of becoming the richest company on earth and had shattered iPhone sales records. On the other hand, Bill Gates revealed that shortly before the Apple co-founder passed away, he sent him an intimate letter. In an interview, Gates said he learned of Jobs' medical condition and wrote him a letter, one that Jobs later kept by his bed. He said, I told Steve about how he should feel great about what he had done and the company he had built. He also visited Jobs during his last days and was quite emotional as per some reports. There's been a little bit of distance uh, now since the passing of Steve Jobs. And, you know, you, you address some of the, the rivalry in the past, but I'm really intrigued by the anecdote at the end of Walter Isaacson's book about how in his final months you came to his house came in through the kitchen and the two of you spent a couple hours together reminiscing and, and really made peace despite years of your ideological uh, differences what do you remember about that time well steve and i about four years ago had a joint uh interview at the d conference where we talked about how exciting it had been and in our career 
the Macintosh work, the early work, uh, I'd bet Microsoft's future on, and Steve had kind of bet his career on it, uh, and that was our most intense working together. Uh, before that, I'd done the basic for the Apple II, but that was more with Wozniak than with Steve. And, you know, so Steve had a very different set of skills than I did. He was every bit as intense, you know, believed in revolutionary ways of using computers, uh, but, you know, not kind of an engineer approach, more of a design approach. And that had huge strengths that uh, particularly the last episode where he ran Apple, he was able to, to do incredible work. So he and I always enjoyed talking. You know, he, uh, you know, would throw some things out, you know, some stimulating things. We'd talk about the other companies that have come along. Uh, we talk about our families and uh, how lucky we've both been in terms of the, the women we married. Yeah, it was great, you know, great, relaxed conversation. Since Steve Jobs' death, Apple has maintained that position for most of those years and is currently under Tim Cook's leadership. Bill Gates still talks extremely favorably of Steve Jobs. It's remarkable what this two-person competition has spawned. Their disagreements push them to polish their own strengths and improve to work harder and develop better things. And both of them will leave an unforgettable impression on the planet. Rest in peace, Steve Jobs. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to leave a like and subscribe to the channel.